thanks. So uh, I guess that everybody can hear me well. So let's get to this. So I do. I, I'm Michał Butrowicz. I'm from. I work at Intel Technology Poland, um, and I'm going to, to talk to you about uh, microservices. Yet another talk about microservices, but with a specific kind of a use case with platform as a service, and it will be kind of an opinionated. I won't. Uh, uh, I won't be showing you anything asynchronous. The basically, plain old HTTP, but in in a cloud. So. About me, like I said, uh, I work at Intel. Uh, I'm a developer and I co-lead a small team. Uh, I now I do backend services, but I did many other projects. Like I did uh, hardware cryptography in C++. I worked with Java, Android. So Python isn't my main technology that I use at work. But it's my favorite, and I think that I'm best with Python, and I hope I hope that I will be doing it even more. And it's my first time presenting, my first Python conference, my you know, a lot of first things. And one thing uh, I'd like to thank Isabella Izinska. So thanks, Isa, because she uh, helped me with some of the things that I'm going to talk about. So basically, I will just give a quick rundown uh, of what microservices are, what platform as a service is. Um, I'm going to show you the ingredi uh, ingredients of a you know, well uh, su of a successful uh, microservice project because it's really easy to get them hard. Like you probably al already heard on other talks. By the way, uh, talk f f uh, about Namico was good. You should totally see that it, they have totally uh, different points <laughs> to make, but. I definitely recommend that because I won't be talking much about you know, philosophy of microservices, and this is basically the middle part of what you need to know. Because first, you need to get into microservices, know what they get you, then you need to implement them, and the stuff that I I'm going to talk about today will help you with that. Um, and of course, we're going to be using Python tools and other stuff. So basically, microservice is a small. Small is a vague term. It can be 50 lines of code. It, it can be 5,000 lines of code. Basically, it has to do one thing well. And their main purpose is to scale well. That is wha that's why they were introduced. And they are somewhat about people, because if you do a big project and you work on a mo monolithic ser service in a 50-person team, it's, gone, it's not going to go well. And with microservices, you can split this uh, uh, into, you know, into chunks that basically can be processed by small teams of people. And that's really good. Like Software development is done by humans. And one thing that you maybe didn't, that maybe didn't, wasn't touched on, on other talks, um, there's the, the, the set of principles, how you do microservices, how you design them, and it's called the 12 factor app. It's done by people at Heroku. Uh, and basically those principles are stuff like that the service needs to be configured through environment variables. It has to be stateless, so any state needs to be kept in a separate uh, service, like a, like a database or a MongoDB, so no SQL base or ever, anything. And you know, like we have some pretty good success stories. Like Netflix is based on microservices, and they have the I know that twenty percent of internet traffic is Netflix. So they can be done right, and they can work, although it's hard. About platform as a service, of course, of course, it's a cloud service, basically in which the smallest unit that you think about is the app. In normal like AWS uh, infrastructure as a service, you think about VMs, like the whole operating system. Here, you think in the terms of the app, and what uh, you know, and you get some you know stuff around it, so, some flavor. Basically, uh, passes should help you with logging, when, with connecting services, with infrastructure, with routing, connecting things together, and stuff like that. It's you know so. You don't have to worry about deployments and all that kind of stuff. So this is nice. 
this is basically how it looks like in an you know, overview. You have your infrastructure at the bottom. We are using AWS and OpenStack. Um, of course, th those are, you know, vi virtual machines. It can be bare metal, th theoretically. <laughs> Over that, you have our pass. We are using Cloud Foundry. Uh, the pass, you know, it, it's, it's many machines, but it's, it's kind of seen as, a, you know, one resource. Resource. You just have your machines, your your RAM, your disk space. Uh, you don't. You aren't aware that there how many machines are there. And pass run, runs containers, and within those containers, finally you have your apps, your microservices. And besides that, on your cloud instance, you can have other stuff and services like CDH, which is Cloudera Hadoop deployment, Log Search, with which I will be talking about later, and basically all the other kinds of stuff, stuff that your apps can use, but those kind of uh, you know, outside services are too heavy to be run within one container, like a massive cluster of Elasticsearch. You can't run that, run that within a Docker container. Um, and when you do microservices on pass, basically you uh, make everything better. <laughs> it seems like the way to go. So the uh, features of microservices are kind of you know, strengthened. And it really makes it easy to scale. Basically, you can just write one command on, in command line interface to scale up my app. Like, I need five more instances. OK, done. And it's good. And if you do everything right, it can be really manageable. You don't need, you aren't supposed to need many people. And it's, the scanning is, is really easy and you know, you can adapt really fast. Like you, need, you can change your code, the behavior of your uh, environment fast, not like with a monolithic serv service that any change requires you to, you know, to get your three old, oldest developers and think about it for a month because you know, it's, everything is hardwired. Uh, but, of course, there are not a silver bullet, not a golden hammer. Uh, if you don't have a much uh, organization, you're going to suffer really, really much. Even though we think we, we had you know, a mature orga organization, like we're pro professionals, but we, you know, we kind of took them lightly. And don't do that, seriously. Like, you write your first tab, play, play with it a bit, and then you set up your continuous del delivery, everything that I will talk about. And of course, you know, not everybody needs microservices. Of course, there's uh, communication overheads because of my, uh, network communication traffic. Basically, you don't communicate through processes, through pipes, uh, or within an application's memory. Everything goes over the network. And of course, the platform as a service thing also has its performance overhead because you need to run the container, you need to manage the VMs a little bit more. And supposedly it's best to start with a monolith first and then just put some stuff out of it into microservice gradually. Uh, supposedly that's what Martin Fowler says, but I al also seen a po post on his blog from uh, half a year later that you can start with microservices. So, uh, people are you know, still figuring things out. So, uh, to have your microservices, you need to have some things set up and you need to follow some so, so rules. So basically, you need those 12-factor apps. I seriously recommend that you uh, read 12-factor uh, net. It's good practice for even other software. Uh, you need to have really good, uh, tight uh, set of tests. And you, have, you need to have your continuous delivery pipeline. You need to have a way to get insight into your platform to gather metrics like response times, is your app even living, is it working uh, correctly. You need to have a specific uh, approach to management of your project because it's challenging. And you basically need some sort of a platform version, but we'll get to that later. I don't know, maybe that's a wrong slide for you people, but you know, Python is great for that. It has as many features as everything else comparing uh, in the realm of uh, backends. 
you can prototype fast and it is good. Uh, testing is really easy. Like you can't mock things as well in Java, for example. And Python is inherently good with loose couplings. And you will see that in microservices, you need to have a lot of loose coupling. This is basically how they are done and how they should be done to be good microservices. Uh, one cool thing, Python could, uh, can have a deterministic garbage collection and you need to, well, you don't need to, but it's a good thing because uh, your app has a RAM uh, limit and if it goes, goes over it, uh, Cloud Foundry or other paths like Heroku will kill it. So it's good to know how big your application will go and you know, not be sure if garbage collection will, st will start or not. And Python is a really enjoyable language and mm, lots of stuff I will be talking about it, but you could be talking about it as well. So. Uh, one thing I was worrying, uh, worried about was performance. Uh, I was worrying if I would get like the, you know, um, basically like 10 times, 100 times slower uh, than the other configuration that we are using, which is Speed, uh, Spring Boot, a Java framework uh, on Tomcat. I've tried Falcon, which I'm going to talk about later, and Micro Whiskey application, and I've basically compared them on a uh, virtual machine to core one gig RAM, and the results were kind of surprising because they are kind of comparable. I did a test with uh, JSON uh, serializing, deserializing, and filtering. And you see that basically Falcon appears to be, a, a Python app seems to be even a little bit faster. Although Spring is more uh, stable. You, you see that Falcon and uh, MicroWizGee has mo more failures, but this, uh, this is supposedly the MicroWizGee thing. It's fast, but it can sometimes you know, give you uh, failures. And I put them under heavy load. Mm. So our app, I propose to use Falcon, but you don't have to. What's good about Falcon, it's really fast for a Python framework. It's light, it's really minimalistic, and there's no magic in it. You can very easily uh, reason about the code just, on, uh, just by looking through it, and it's good if you have a big team and you have lot of uh, lots of technologies, like one service is in Java, one, in, one, one is in Go, one is in Python, and if you have to go through them and every one of them is written in some exotic framework that basically needs to be learned like a different language, but this isn't good for the team. And if you had some errors, it's good to be able to reason about the code. And I don't work or, uh, of, or on Falcon or, or anything, I just you know, liked it. Uh, this is a kind of b bigger example. Uh, you see that it's so minimalistic that even uh, it explicitly says that request streams, like you see in the post and the you know, last, uh, second la last line, we have re request stream read. Like it's so minimalistic that it only gives you streams, for example, to uh, the uh, request's body. And when you r write the response, you can also write directly to, to a stream. And we can use Python 3. I don't see a reason why uh, we w don't all switch to Python 3 for doing stuff like that. And that's one cool thing about microservices. You can experiment with your uh, technology because you're not thinking about mm, what am I going to do with this, with this big monolithic app in a year. No, you can basically rewrite it or just throw it out. So it's fine to you know, experiment a little, have some fun. And now how should your how does your app, app look like? Well, it's a basic directory structure, you know, standard Python application. Although you don't need to actually have a setup pie, you don't need to package anything because you're just uploading source to the platform. So it's not actually not needed. You, know, you have your standard, standard app code, you have your test code, which can have a separate requirements file. You need to have your service tests, about which I will talk later. You can have talks. Talks is good, I recommend talks. Uh, then we have those uh, Cloud Foundry specific files. There's the manifest YAML, which basically tells uh, Cloud Foundry how to deploy your app. 
there's the runtime txt. It's a, a version of Python that you want to have in your in your container. So three, four, two, seven, whatever. And CF ignore is like uh, git ignore, but it's it tells Cloud Foundry what files not to deploy because basically it just takes the whole directory that you're in and it pushes it to the container, and you don't want that. This is how a m manifest YAML uh, looks like. See that it's declarative. Uh, you just specify the name, the command that you use to run the app w when in the container, how much memory, what uh, wh what build pack to use. Build packs are basically uh, shell scripts that set your app uh, up. Uh, they run pip, install the, install the uh, dependencies automatically for you, and stuff like that. You also uh, show what services should be bind. Services are those uh, external resources. They they all also can be other apps, and they when you bind a service, it just put puts its configuration in the app's environment, so you can uh, configure them and connect them more easily. And you can have a c uh, custom uh, env uh, environment parameters parameters. Like here, I've used log level to set up my logging and version, uh, which is interpreted by my program. Well, basically, version is just a, is just a tag. It's good to uh, know uh, what version of uh, app you have deployed if you have many uh, environments. Basically, mm, yeah. And let's go further. Continues the delivery. Yeah. There, uh, there were talks about it. There are resources on the internet, and you will have a really, really, really bad time if you don't do this right. Uh, basically, you know, you won't know if your uh, apps are working, and if, if if you have a network of 20 or so apps, you don't know if they are working, who broke them, what broke them, one of them, which of them is actually broken, are all of them broken? You don't know, so you have many beautiful evenings. At, at the office, just figuring this stuff out and looking through logs. Hmm. Uh, proposed uh, continuous delivery flow. As you can see, this is basically how it can go. Just a few commands. You clone your repository. Uh, recursive because uh, when you do code reuse, code reuse isn't, code reuse is dangerous when it comes to microservices because you don't want a lot of coupling. Uh, but you know, sometimes, like for utility code or something like that, it's of course it's pretty useful. And I found that it's maybe not the best, but it's one of the ways that you redistribute your uh, dependencies is through uh, Git submodules, basically, because y you don't need packages for the stuff that you put in Cloud Foundry, and you can use with that. You also need to do a uh, uh, you know, a hack in init uh, pi to uh, load, uh, add submodules to the Python paths, but it works per perfectly well. Then you run Tox, which runs your tests, your unit tests, your service tests. You bump the version up, so you, know, you, you see that the version was changed. C CF push is a command of the Cloud Foundry command line interface, which basically takes the manifest, takes your app, and just puts it in, in the platform. Then you do some commands, I know, what, whatever you want to run end-to-end -end tests, because you should run end-to-end -end tests after every, basically after every commit, the new version of, of the app needs to be deployed to your at least staging environment. And you want to have tests that will run after it. And then you switch, CF target is, uh, it switches the place in which, uh, the, at which the common line interface points. So you have another environment, and you should have at least two environments, and you just pu push it to production, and that's the whole that's the whole whole thing that you need to do. So deployments and continuous the delivery can be pretty easy, like <laughs> easy, haha, <laughs> but pretty simple from the uh, overview if you're using uh, platform as a service. You know, and after this, you have a working new version of your app in pr production. Yeah. Now about the tests. Uh, you of course need to unit tests. You, have, you need to have a lot of them. You know, the greatest coverage you can do. 
When uh, you're using Whisky apps, uh, one cool thing that you have an interface, a Whisky interface, and you can test your app as a whole, almost, because you, you, ca you can use the normal Whisky controllers, but you only need to mock out the external connectors. Um, this is how a Falcon test can look like. Uh, you, you pr probably, I if you want to do Falcon, you can get, get back to it later. About uh, another approach to designing your app would be not to use Whisky, but to use some sort of um, asynchronous, uh, like some publisher, pub publish subscribe uh, method. Basically, you have your you know, RabbitMQ, Kafka. There's this thing called NATS, which is a cloud fund, a queuing system, a messaging system native to Cloud Foundry. Basically, all the logs and all the communication be between the parts of Cloud Foundry is done through NATS, and you can connect to it and send messages through it. And using this kind of thing can kind of make your unit test easier because you just uh, mock out the, you know, the consumer mock out the producer and just put stuff in there and see what goes out. So this can be somewhat simpler. And the uh, Namiko guys do do this, basically. So queuing is okay, but uh, we've found that we don't want it. About service testing. What it is, basically you take your whole service the same way it's, it runs in, in the container in your actual environment and you just put, put fakes around it. There's this one uh, service uh, cool tool called uh, Mountebank. Mountebank. It's basically a configurable uh, light server. You can, you can configure it by calling some HTTP methods and it just sets up like stub endpoints that can be used by your service. Uh, so a any interface that the service needs to consume, you can stub it with Montebank. Basically, uh, the test looks like this, that you uh, set a fake environment, so, so you just put uh, the right environment vari variables in your environment, you run the Montebank process, you do some calls to configure it, then you run your app, and you call it with the test client. And basically it just, it is the same, the app doesn't know that it is in the cloud, it's like in the matrix. And this gives you a pretty de decent degree of confidence that it actually will work. And it's really important to have that. You can't run end-to-end -end tests all the time. And when you do that, when you uh, want to te test everything with end-to-end -end tests, you have uh, a lot of time to get the response. Is everything working? And it's not that cool. And both of those kinds of tests, uh, unit tests and service tests, can be run with talks. Uh, and there's a specific way you configure talks because it's a specific usage. Basically, you only need one Python version because your app only runs in one, uh, one types of, of containers and you can specify what those are. Uh, you don't need packaging, so you have the handy option of skip as this too. You also can add the, like pylint, coverage, and everything that you need. Uh, basically, it's really cool to have like only to run your talks command and your CI knows that the app should work and the developer no, knows that it works and, it, and he, uh, he or she gets like full uh, r report on the, uh, on the app's uh, state. And about test clients, there's this one cool thing that you can use. Has any one of you heard about Swagger? Do you know what Swagger is? Okay, so this is Swagger. Uh-huh. No, but seriously, it looks more of, more like, yeah, enjoy, enjoy. My one funny picture. This is what Swagger looks like, basically. It's a live uh, API doc, so I really re recommend it. Uh, you can, you know, uh, e 
explore your app, uh, even call the uh, pop, 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 call the endpoints. So you can. It's great for uh, introducing new people and for uh, giving it to people who want to integrate your services. And with, Swa with Swagger, you can have uh, this kind of a flow. Basically, you have your, uh, your app on the right, and there are some tools that allow you to, you to generate Swagger docs from your app. It's harder for Python because we don't have this static, static typing. So, and, and for testing, it's, it's better if you, ha if, you, if you have your API uh, declaration, like uh, description, elsewhere, and being independent. And Python needs to write it manually, sadly, but it's not that a, a lot of work. And mm, then, uh, when you have do those docs, you can host them uh, in a uh, on some endpoint, and basically just get it, uh, the JSON document that. Mm -hmm describes your app, but you also can set up the web UI that you saw er er earlier, and you can do some other cool stuff with it. For example, you can uh, generate a client uh, client for, for your service from this, uh, from this interface description, and use it in tests, and use it for other apps. And it's cool because you have, uh, you really keep your contract under control. You know, so nobody messes around with it and, it, and when it goes to review, if someone you know, makes changes that break the API, it will be immediately visible. About uh, acceptance tests or end-to-end -end tests, they, of course, need to be done in, in, st in the staging environment, in your test environment. It's best to run them after each commit, but you need to have fast suite of tests to run them after each commit. And this is a hard thing to do, basically. You need to trim your tests and keep the test base small. Uh, but sometimes maybe you, you can get, a, uh, get away with it by running them nightly if you have great service tests. And what uh, one important piece of advice, somebody should own end-to-end -end tests Everybody should own own end-to-end -end tests. It's a common good, but somebody needs to, you know, uh, com uh, facilitate communication between your developers, uh, and you know, keep everybody in the know uh, about what other people are, are testing, so you avoid duplication, you avoid making your tests longer. Uh, some few, few more more points. Uh, it's good to have monitoring, of course. You can use Zabbix, you can use, what was it called? Uh, I, I forgot, no, Google monitoring, you'll find something good. Uh, you should monitor both your production and your staging environment because Cloud Foundry and all other paths that you maintain by your, yourself, there can be some funny stuff. RAM can go out, disk space can go out, mm. No, all kinds of things can happen. But one cool thing that the uh, whole uh, platform lets it, uh, lets, lets it be, it allows for easy monitoring. So uh, it isn't that hard. It, give, it gives you a lot of statistics and stuff. And what about other thing about monitoring? It basically should sometimes run some form of end-to-end -end test to, you know, keep you uh, in confidence that your platform is still working. Because basically, maybe someone, so some developer uh, logged in and did some bad stuff that he or she shouldn't do. About logs and metrics that you get, uh, like I said, all apps should log to standard output. Uh, and those, all of the logs are aggregated and basically available as a stream uh, for some consumers, and you can do a lot of stuff with them, like put them in Elk. Elk is Elasticsearch Logs Tash Kibana. There also was a talk about this, a good talk, probably <laughs> definitely better than mine. Uh, and Log Search is a cloud scale uh, 
deployment of Elk Stash. Basically, it can aggregate logs from your whole platform, from all of your apps, all of the platform uh, components, and put them in Elasticsearch so they can be searchable, easy. And you can visualize, the, visualize them with Kibana. You can see what went wrong uh, through all of your pl platform. But basically, if you have some uh, distributed transaction, not transaction is a wrong word, but an operation that touches, I don't know, 15 apps, and something went wrong. And you, just, you, you can just go to Kibana, show me this place in time, and what uh, error messages got sent by what app, and, and you'll see that. And it's a really cool thing to have that. It's really you know, em empowers logging. And you can use uh, uh, data series, uh, time series da database for your uh, real-time metrics. For example, uh, what are the r response times of your apps right now? Because Cloud Foundry gives you that knowledge. And you basically need to just consume it and do something with it. And you can put it in FluxDB, for example, and just you know, check it, <laughs> visualize it, put it in a graph somewhere. And just you know, be constantly aware of uh, what your, how are your uh, microservices doing, and if they run fast enough. Also, uh, like I said, it's about the people, and some tips. Um, basically, every app needs to have an owner, a person who will be responsible for it with their reputation, life, honor, etc. Uh, of course. One person couldn't do everything alone, and you have this pesky uh, hit by a bus syndrome. So you need to have an additional person to help that one owner, and they have to. They need to have a common vision for your whole uh, service, and they basically need to, you know, seriously, thoroughly review every change that comes in. When you do microservices, you probably have a big team. Probably people are, you know, switching between the teams, so you have different styles, and somebody needs to keep track of that so you won't end up with a mess. Uh, but one thing, nobody is unquestionable, of course, so the new guy that comes in, or a group, can, you know, like, have some valid points, and you should listen to them. And also, one cool stuff, it's good to have some form of architecture visualization because you have all that s services and they have the dependencies uh, connecting them. And it's good to, if you're sitting in a one room, it's good to have like a board and just you know visualize it. If not that, you should share some uh, you know, UML or whatever. Last thing, uh, platform deployments, I, you know, they were in the bullets later. This is stuff that you don't get out of the box. And some people even say that you shouldn't do it uh, because uh, it en encourages coupling. Basically, platform deployments, platform versioning, is something like that, that you uh, have a list of all your apps and their versions. And you know what kinds of versions work well with, it, with each other. And this kind of encourages coupling because you expect specific versions to work with specific versions, and you shouldn't have that. You should basically should be able to switch everything around to some degree. Uh, but there are still use cases, use cases for it. We have use cases because we want to, you know, like uh, destroy one instance and just put up another Cloud Foundry and set everything up. We made a custom implementation that uh, has this one big manifest that merges all the other manifests and uh, analyzes the, the dependencies between the apps and basically um, deploys them in, a, in the correct order. And this is it's maybe not needed for you, but it's a cool thing to have. And one last thing, oh, one last uh, thing about uh, endpoints. I recommend that you use those endpoints with a uh, version in the beginning, because if you, you're going you're going to be changing one thing, you don't want to have to change two things at once, and that even the, the wor worst uh, the worst case is to you know you change one app, and then you need to change the other one, 
and then you want to switch back, and you can because the other one has incompatible changes. So basically, use uh, endpoint versioning, and uh, you know keep uh, different generations of your API around for a while. So you know, so everything is fluent and everything is nicely, loosely coupled, and you can move your apps around. And if you want, you have a big slide with more links, more stuff. I really, really recommend the book in the beginning. Uh, O'Reilly book about m microservices is good. And you have some other micro uh, Euro Python talks that I enjoy that are somewhat you know, connected to this. And that's all that I have for you today. Michal, uh, do we have any questions? Hi, I thought when you were talking about the monitoring, I do th the thing you were looking for in your mind was Moonin or Nagios or something like that. Nagios, right. So, the real question. It's been almost a half a year since this Microsoft this thing exploded. It feels like a hype, but it doesn't quite. I have already read the book, all the links I went to the, uh, the conference and that, but the the f the end I have this feeling, this strange, I cannot even see people really using it. I mean, obviously we all know the case of Netflix, for example, they have a uh, hundred uh, microservices, but it's impossible to see them, they are all in-house. Do you know any kind of resource where people are putting real their microservices to people to look out? I mean, yeah, the, uh, there's a problem, there's not many open source pro I, I didn't, basically there's, there are no open source pro projects yet that, that use them. The, uh, the, it was the same issue with the Namico presentation. There's nothing yet. There's nothing open yet. Sorry. Because M feeling, maybe in a year. The feeling is like this: the people of the that use and design the Namico is a closed company. They have their products, and that's it. But in other kind of projects, like for example, Django installation, you can go. You can even download the Euro Python doc page, and it's there. It's a Django application. You can look at it. But if, uh, the microservices that doesn't seem to be nobody that's really exposing how they are using. Yeah, basically it's a kind of a, you know, a, an approach that only just you know gets you know more uh, more widely adopted. And you know, like it's sad. It it would have do us mu much good probably if if we had something like that. But sadly, there's nothing yet. But you know, uh, maybe we'll have something. I don't know. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Uh, you talked about writing uh, stats into your microservices and health R checks. R writing sets? Uh, stats. Uh, yeah. Statistics and health into your microservice. And well, I ba basically, you don't need to write uh, a lot of stuff in. You get it out of the box. Like uh, Cloud Foundry. Uh, Keeps the tabs of like the, the messages that get passed around. This is one uh, one of the reasons why we use HTTP because it's really uh, you know uh, it, it's visible. You can see uh, all the messages that went uh, between services and the uh, response times of all the messages. So you kind of get that out, out of the box. Your app just writes to standard output like normal logging, and you have some of those stuff you know out of the box, but. You basically as answered my question. Uh, what do you suggest uh, for registering and looking up for microservices? Uh, any central repository, Re any tool you used? Uh, well, I think that uh, Lymph people uh, have a re register. We're not using it exactly because we, we, like, we know what's in our platform. Uh, and Cloud Foundry has this uh, command line interface that basically gives you that. Y you see the apps, you can check uh, what app is connected to what other app. So you kind of have it out, out of the box. And if you have Swagger, uh, you, see, uh, you know that uh, Cloud Foundry lets you see all the apps. And, you, and if you have Swagger deployed, then you can just go to the endpoint uh, within the app with Swagger. And just look what it, what's uh, what it API is. So, and you can uh, you can also like only uh, host the uh, Swagger docs within the apps, and you can have uh, another like documentation app that 
uh, has all the other apps bound to it, like it knows about them, and it uh, combines all of the other docs in like this one global platform API document, live platform document API. So this is cool. Okay, that's all the time we have for questions. If you have any more, then Michal will be around. So thank you, Michal.